I mean, first service clapped at that. Come on. <laughs> if you like, oh, come on. Yeah, yeah. If you don't have chills from that, you better check your pulse, okay? That is one of my <laughs> most beloved, one of my favorite pieces of music. That is the Hallelujah Chorus, which is part of Handel's Messiah, which for years has been a Christmas staple. And I know what you're thinking. I don't seem like the type that's into classical music. And um, I'm not offended by that. My sweet spot is... 90s R&B, but I also love classical music, and um, I'll just out myself. On Spotify this year, that was my most listened to. I know, shocking, right? Um, it's because I was working from home, that's all it is. So I want to tell you about Handel's Messiah today, this, and I want to tell you the story of Handel's Messiah, and it's going to take us where we need to go today. So in 1741, there was a man named Charles Jennings. Charles Jennings lived in England, and he was a librettist. Any librettists in the room? Just kidding, that's not a thing anymore, okay? <laughs> I was checking your honesty. He was a librettist, and librettists would write lyrics for composers to compose to. And so this librettist was a devout man of faith, a faithful follower of Jesus, and he perceived a problem creeping into the church in his day. There is this worldview, this pervasive mindset, this philosophy called deism that was creeping its way into the church. And Jennings was side-eyeing it and didn't like it. And what deism suggested, it's way too much to talk about, but I'll just tell you this. It suggested that, uh, God, the Lord, the Schmord, whatever, like he's, he's up there, but like he's not active and involved in history, okay? The Lord's like far off away, probably created things, and then he's uh, not active, not involved. And there was, because of this, people kind of started getting a little lax about the Bible and kind of deferential to the Bible. I mean, I guess it's not really important if God's far off. And so Jennings went, no, 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 no. Check the score, because he talked like that. Check the score. That's not what's going on. And so what Jennings wanted to do is to, to turn people back to Scripture, to rouse people back to the Lord, and to show that, no, 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 the Lord is active and involved in history. And we know that through the brilliance of the word that he's given us, the brilliance of scripture and the evidence of the unfolding history of redemption of the world. So Jennings was in his fields. So he starts to pen a beautiful orchestral work that he's hoping someone will compose to. And this is what he does. He traces the entire arc of scripture through the theme of Jesus the Messiah. Focus on that. And he splits this brilliant work up into three parts. The first part, we'll look at the Old Testament, or looked at the Old Testament prophecies, stories, and events that then led up to the birth of Jesus, part one. Part two was the life, suffering, and crucifixion of Jesus the Messiah. And then part three was about the triumphant resurrection of Jesus and ultimate victory of Jesus the Messiah. Jennings put this together, and he shot for the moon. He wanted someone to compose it, and in his day in England, the most prominent, most famous composer was a man named George Friedrich Handel. Boom, this guy. Ladies, not only was he talented musically, but let's be honest, total eye candy, right? <laughs> for real, for real, this guy could not be famous today. And I think he actually used to deliver pizzas to my dorm room back in the day. I don't know. <laughs> anyway, so uh, Handel may not be a looker, but he was incredibly talented. And so Handel received this work, that, this libretto that Jennings composed, and he was moved. He was inspired. He had chills. And so he did something that most composers in his day did not do or were incapable of doing. And he t wrote an orchestral work, a, an opus orchestral work in three to four weeks. And my man worked 24 hours a day, seven days a week. He barely ate. He barely slept. He barely took care of himself. If you're in the room or watching online and you have a newborn, you know what I'm talking about. You're on that same grind right now, that same grind. And that's what he did. And he came up with this brilliant work, put music to it, and he called it Messiah. He didn't need an overly elaborate name because the content that he was sharing was so rich and brilliant. He just wanted to tell the 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 story and the narrative of Jesus, the Messiah, and the unfolding of redemptive history. And so Jennings and Handel took their work, and they wanted to debut in a small theater. So they went to a little place called Dublin, Ireland, and on Easter 1742. 
And there's, they, they purposely went in this small theater so it would feel kind of intimate and so that, there, that everyone's voice would kind of resonate and, and build. And the theater, because Handel was so famous and so many people were excited about this work, the theater had to put out like a flyer that said, men, don't bring your swords. And women, don't be wearing your hoop skirts. Apparently they were hula hoop skirts back in the day. And this is because, you know, I've been to a lot of concerts. I've heard like no flash photography, no loitering. Never heard like, don't bring your sword. Leave your sword in the car. But that's, that's how cringe it was going to be. Literally shoulder to shoulder. And people heard Messiah for the first time and got changed. Critics wrote about it and said that it was a sublime experience. They felt like, especially in the crowning moment, the hallelujah course, almost like they were transported to the, to the new heavens and new earth. That, that almost like the, the, the veil or the wall between heaven and earth got thinned. And people were moved by it, and it became an international success. And over the years, it's become a Christmas staple because there's been a proliferation of classical music and orchestrations about Easter, which is what Handel kind of wrote it for originally, but not a lot. There's kind of a paucity of stuff on Christmas. And because Handel's Messiah covers first the Old Testament prophecies leading up to the birth of Jesus in part one, it became a Christmas staple. And so today, while Handel's Messiah is one of the most well-known pieces of music in the world, maybe you don't know it well. Uh, even though it's incredibly famous, maybe it's not familiar to you. But that's okay, because this time of year, it's everywhere. It's, I, I use the illustration, it's like a TV on in the background. You might not know it's there or be listening to it, but it's there. It's in commercials this time of year. It's in shows this time of year. No one's really opening up concert halls and theaters, but if they were open, they'd be playing Handel's Messiah. And so what I want to do today is bring an awareness to this brilliant work. And what I want to do today is give you an appreciation of this brilliant work, because it's going to take us where we need to go today. And today, like Jennings, like Handel, I want to trace the biblical theme of Jesus as the Messiah. And like Handel and like Jennings did, I want to look at the Old Testament events and themes and prophecies that led to the birth of Jesus. Like Handel and Jennings, I also want to talk about the life and the redemptive work and death of Jesus. But then like them as well, I want to talk about the triumphant resurrection of Jesus and ultimate rule and reign of Jesus. And so that's where we're going today. And again, this is what Messiah does. If you listen through, it just tracks scripture that way and shows us Jesus as the Messiah. So let's talk about that today. Let's get it. And here's what I want. I'm gonna give you the outcome that I want for today. Normally teachers say that for like the end of a sermon. I wanna tell you at the beginning of the sermon what I want for us today. And what I want for us today after we hear this, is to be filled with awe and wonder over what the Lord has done. What we're going to see should inspire us. It should amaze us. We should marvel at what the Lord has done. But then secondly, we should submit and align our lives under the Lordship of Jesus. By the time we get to the end of this, that's what I want us to do, to come under the Messiahship and the Lordship of Jesus. And then lastly, I want us to celebrate the ultimate victory of Jesus as we wait. And I'll explain that. And as we get into this, as we're going to run through Genesis, through Revelation, and track this theme, here is my premise. This is about a king and a kingdom. So let's dive into it. Genesis. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. That's going to be significant. Everyone say, heavens and earth. If you're watching on Embassy Plus, go ahead and type that. I did this first service, too. I always type up here. Bring your hands down to a reasonable level and type it that way, heavens and earth. I did that first service too. Yeah. When you talk with your hands, anything can happen, okay? I never know what's gonna happen. All right, this is real talk. So heavens and the earth, God creates the heavens and the earth and he says that it is good. He uses the word tov, it is good. And sometimes I think we forget this, we forget Genesis 1 and we look at the world and think, man, everything's been trashed for a hot minute. No, 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 no. The creator, the Lord Almighty, created the heavens and the earth and he called them good. And then he took people, Adam and Eve, the first people, our representatives, took humanity and put them in the garden, put them amongst creation to work it and keep it and care for it and to become, pay attention to this, co-rulers. Under the lordship of the Lord Almighty, under the kingship of the Lord Almighty, humanity was supposed to co-rule creation along with. That was the plan. That was the intention. But the problem was that humanity, Adam and Eve, 
rebelled against the Lord and did what was right. This, the Bible uses this all the time. Did what was right in their own eyes. And because of that, there's a separation from the Lord. And man, in Genesis, everything from that point spirals out of control. We see sin and death enter into the world. We see violence enter into the world. We see people warring against each other. We see murder, betrayal, jealousy, envy, all this nastiness. And that's kind of where things go after creation. But there is hope. Everyone say, there is hope. NMC Plus, at a reasonable height type, there is hope. There is hope. That's right. The Lord later on in the book of Exodus, he chooses this people Israel, and he'd actually made promises to Israel's forefather, Abraham. And the Lord takes this people, this nation of Israel, and he liberates them from being under the tyranny and enslavement of a bad king. And he says, mm -mm. the Lord says, mm -mm. you're going to be my people, and I'm going to make you a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. And through you, Israel, I'm going to fulfill my promises to your ancestors, and you're going to bless all peoples of the world. You're going to represent me to all peoples of the world, and you are going to help bring about my right rule and reign upon the earth. And Israel is going to be a nation that becomes co-rulers under the lordship of the Lord Almighty, under the kingship of the Lord Almighty. Just like Adam and Eve, just like humanity was supposed to do, to, to, to co-rule the Lord's creation. So Israel was going to do that and help bring about his right rule and reign upon the earth. But, eh, problem. Israel's like not content with the Lord as king, and so they want a king of their own choosing. So they appoint this guy named Saul. He's hot trash and doesn't do very well. And, but the Lord is kind and raises up another king named David. And David is a good king, and the Lord in his kindness, I'd like to emphasize that, not necessarily because David was the most incredible person and earned every bit of it, but the Lord in his kindness made a promise to David, who was king over Israel, and he was going to take this whole, this, this whole promise to Israel and carry it forward. And in 2 Samuel 7, Verses 12 to 13, the Lord speaks through one of his prophets to David and says, when your days are fulfilled and you lie down with your fathers, I will raise up your offspring after you, who shall from your body, or sorry, who shall come from your body and I will establish his kingdom. He shall build a house for me, for my name, and I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. Now here's what I need you to hold on to. This is going to be a central promise for the people of Israel. There's going to be a king that comes from the line of David. And that king is going to rule forever. Do human kings rule forever? No. Do human kingdoms last forever? No. So this is kind of, this is kind of odd. This is kind of strange. We'll unpack this more. The verse will go on to say that this king will rule in justice and righteousness and so this was a hope for Israel. They're like, okay, we're going to be part of this. But then the problem is, after David comes a long line and a long sequence of bad kings. And you know what the bad kings do? The same thing that Adam and Eve did. They rebel and do what is right in their own eyes. And they fail to be good co-rulers over the earth that they were called to be. And because of this, the Lord allows them to go into exile. As things are spiraling out of control, just like they did in Genesis, things are spiraling out of control in Israel, the Lord allows them and is going to make them actually go into exile into a foreign land and be conquered. And so Israel's hopes are dashed. The promise made to David of a king and a kingly line seems kind of far away, and they are in a bad spot. But there is hope. Everyone say there is hope. And MC Plus, there was hope. I don't know why I'm playing it like a piano. <laughs> How big is your keyboard? <laughs> and so they go into exile, and during exile, again, disappointed, disheartened, discouraged. But hope rises. And an expectation begins to form around this king that would come from the line of David. And prophecy after prophecy comes to the fore. And different prophets paint kind of with different, uh, with, with different colors on the palette. And they describe the Messiah in different ways. And after years and years and years, and different prophets living in different places, all in exile, they, there's kind of vision comes together of this, this promised king that would come. And this king would become known as the, not a, the Messiah. 
And Messiah, I've explained this before, comes from the Hebrew Mashiach, which simply means anointed one, often a king or a priest. So again, another word for king. You can call a president president or commander in chief. This is very similar. King or Mashiach. And this became a loaded word. I need you to hold on to that. Came a loaded word. And here's what people believed about this Messiah, putting everything together. The Messiah would come from the line of David. We know that because of the promise made to David we just talked about that everything will point back to today. This king will rule forever. And because of that, this king would be fully human, but also uh, like fully divine. Yes, a person, but also the, the, the God making his dwelling among people, the presence of God manifest on the earth. And the reign of this Messiah, the reign of this king would last forever. And this king would finally bring true justice and righteousness in a world where it didn't seem like it existed very often. And this king would bring about the right rule and reign of the Lord upon the earth. And so these were the expectations of Messiah. And we can see different authors, different prophets arise who speak into this. So let's look at Isaiah 9. This is actually part of Handel's Messiah. He covers this verse. Isaiah 9, verse 6. Someday people will say, for to us a child is born, the child being the Messiah. To us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulders, and his name shall be called Wonderful, Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Here's what's really interesting. Oh, it's, it's just a child, but it's also Mighty God. Everlasting Father. There's something about this Messiah, fully God, fully man, divine in the flesh. And then the verse continues, next verse. Of the increase of his, the Messiah's government, and of peace, I want to talk about that, but we don't have time. There will be no end. On the throne of, who? who? Throne of who? David. David. And over his kingdom to establish it and to uphold it with justice and with righteousness from this time forth and forevermore. The zeal of the Lord of hosts will accomplish this. And so we see all these plans, purposes, and promises of the Lord. We see all these things they were looking for in the Messiah, and the the picture gets more clear. Then in Isaiah 61, he continues, and he describes what exactly the Messiah will proclaim someday. And he says, someday the Messiah in Isaiah 61 will say this, the spirit of the Lord God is upon me because the Lord has anointed me to bring good news to the poor. He has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives and to the opening of the prison to those who are bound, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor and the day of vengeance of our God, to comfort all who mourn. Now hold on to this. This is, this is your part, okay, in the sermon. Hold on to Isaiah 61. The Messiah will say this someday. And His rule will not only be from the line of David, not only be divine, not only be forever, not only be with true justice and righteousness, bring the right rule and reign of the Lord upon the earth, but this will actually be good news for all people. Uh, but, uh, But then there's this weird prophecy that doesn't seem to coincide with the rest of them. Uh... It's like the Messiah is also going to suffer and die in order to cover and forgive people's sins. And we read about this in Isaiah 53. This is describing one day what will happen to the Messiah. Isaiah writes, but he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was the chastisement that brought us peace. And with his wounds, we are healed. We all like sheep have gone astray. We have turned everyone to his own way. And the Lord has laid upon him, the Messiah, the iniquity of us all. I thought this king was going to rule and reign and probably be autonomous and do whatever. But somehow this king would suffer and die too. This fully God, fully man king was going to suffer and die. And what we need to know is that Israel had a long history of making sacrifices in order to put themselves in right alignment with the Lord. And they would always try to go for a perfect and unblemished animal to sacrifice so they would know they were in right standing with the Lord. And somehow this Messiah would come along and become that perfect sacrifice to atone for it, forgive, and cover sins for all time. And so these are the expectations of the Messiah. And this is what the people of Israel waited upon in exile. And they waited and they waited. And then you know what? They go back into into their homeland and it's just more of the same. They, they endure conquest after conquest, oppression after oppression, waiting after waiting, disappointment after disappointment, failed Messiah after failed Messiah. And that brings us to the end of the Old Testament. And that's how things are left. But 
there was hope. Everyone say, there was hope. Because when you open up the New Testament, as you jump into the New Testament, people are coming in hot. Matthew, the, the gospel writer Matthew comes in hot. And he fills us with hope and has a good word for us. And this is really interesting to me. Do you guys know how Matthew starts? Do you know how the New Testament starts? It starts with a family genealogy of Jesus. Probably not what you expected. You probably wanted like an like a epic, like once upon a time or like in a world. Something more epic. No, this is a family genealogy. But watch what Matthew does. Matthew 1, literally verse 1. The book, this is Matthew, the book of the genealogy of Jesus the Messiah. Matthew's not trying to play around. He's being really clear and explicit with who Jesus is. This expectation that's been billowing, someone from the line of David, this Messiah, boom, verse one of the New Testament, the Messiah, the son of who? David, David callback, consistency, brilliantly interwoven through scripture. The gospel writer Luke he describes things this way. He goes on in, in, in Luke chapter one, where we often go for the birth narratives of Jesus. He describes the visit of a messenger of the Lord to Mary. And the messenger of the Lord says, hey, you're gonna have a child and his name will be Jesus. And then watch what he says about Jesus. Check this out. He will be great and will be called the son of the most high and the Lord God will give to him the, oh, throne of his father who? Boom, see the intentionality there? And he will reign over the house of Jacob forever and of his kingdom there will be no end. Again, from the line of David, fully human, fully divine, will reign forever in justice and righteousness, bringing the Lord's right rule and reign upon the earth. That is what is happening in Jesus the Messiah. But let's fast forward in the story. What, so what did Jesus do? So after the birth, this is where we normally stop the Christmas story. But watch this. Jesus is going to clearly point to himself and clearly take on and step into the role of Messiah in Luke chapter 4. So let me tee this up for you. Jesus is a young man, young in his ministry, and he goes to his hometown. He goes to a synagogue, which is kind of like his version of like a church gathering, and he's going to read from a scroll like you did back then. And he reaches for the scroll, Isaiah 61, Remember how I told you guys to remember Isaiah 61? He reaches for Isaiah 61 and he starts to read it. And we can read about this in Luke chapter four. Jesus says, I love this. The spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim liberty to the captives and recovering of sight to the blind, to set at liberty those who are oppressed, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. Jesus, the Messiah, quotes Isaiah 61 directly. So we see this beautiful continuity between the prophets in exile saying, one day, this is what the Messiah will say, Isaiah 61. And then Jesus stands up in front of his first crowd, literally his first sermon, and he goes, hey, Isaiah 61, that's right, I'm that guy. And then, in case people missed it, Jesus gets real explicit with it, and he goes, um, uh, today, that is fulfilled in your midst. Mic drop, walks away. Jesus is making a clear claim that he is the Messiah, and this is good news. And Jesus would go on to proclaim good news to the poor. He would go on to free people. He would go on to literally give sight to the blind. And so as Jesus progressed in his ministry, he proved again and again that he was the long-awaited Messiah, the true king. And he would bring in his life and in his day the Lord's right rule and reign upon the earth. In fact, when Jesus' disciples, his closest followers, ask Jesus, how do we pray? How do we live? What should we want? What is our worldview? Jesus says, pray to the, to the Father, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And so Jesus was bringing about this right rule and reign that would be a forever reign for followers of Jesus. And Jesus told people to love God and love their neighbor. And to, 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 he moved towards people in compassion. And he claimed again and again and told people that he was the Messiah. He was the long-awaited king. He was the hope they were searching for. And it's not like people went, oh, okay. People bought into it. People believed. People were changed over this. The miraculous happened. And even Jesus' disciples, when he asked them, who do you guys think I am? They, they say in Matthew 16, 16, oh, you're the Messiah. <laughs> There's no two ways about it. But then Jesus, 
proved his, his messiahship in the most heartbreaking, heart-wrenching way, but still consistent with the brilliance of Scripture and the continuity of the history of redemption the Lord has unfolded. Jesus fulfills the prophecy of Isaiah 53. He was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our sins. The punishment that brought us peace was laid upon him. We, like sheep, have gone astray, but, but Jesus has taken on all of our sins. You know what? They described it, the Apostle Paul describes it this way in 2 Corinthians and the New Testament. He says that he who knew no sin, the Messiah, uh, became sin so that we might have the righteousness of the Messiah. Somehow, because of what Jesus has done, we, can, we are given his goodness. We are given his right standing upon the Lord, and we are in right standing because of what he has done. In Romans, Paul says this. He says, the Lord demonstrated his love to us in this, that while we were still sinners, the Messiah died for us. And in showing this brilliant cohesion and consistency with, and continuity of Scripture, Paul writes in 1 Corinthians 15 that the Messiah died for sins according to the scriptures. And so Jesus, in his death, his crucifixion, proved that he was the Messiah. But here's the thing. How long, ooh, I'm gonna test you, how long was the Messiah's rule supposed to reign? Let me hear, let me hear. All right, t t type that on NMC+. Plus. Forever, right? So do human kings, human kings stay dead, correct? Human kingdoms come to an end, correct? Yeah, okay, well, so Jesus, after he was murdered on the cross, buried, three days later, Jesus said, enough of this, and he rose from the grave. And his resurrection was his official coronation as the Messiah. Because the Messiah had to be fully human, fully divine, and Jesus proved his fully human, fully divine victory over sin and death by his resurrection. And he proved that his reign would be the forever reign because it wasn't over at death. It would go on. And so we celebrate that every Sunday in a sense. Every Sunday is like Easter. We celebrate that. The coming of the Messiah and then the work the Messiah did and the resurrection and ultimate victory of Jesus. And then the Messiah, Jesus the Messiah, after he walked the earth for 40 days, many, 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 many people saw him. He ascended to the right hand of God the Father. And you might think, well, the king's gone. What's going on? But there is hope. Everyone say, there is hope. Because the king, because Jesus the Messiah said, no, nah, I'm gonna come back. And he left his followers to continue his rule and his reign, his on earth as it is in heaven. And his, the early followers of Jesus, they followed Jesus. They lived in his kingdom, the kingdom of heaven, the number one thing Jesus preached about. And you know what they did? They did what Jesus did. And they, and they loved God and they loved their neighbors. And they moved towards people in compassion and they spoke truth to people and told people about Jesus the Messiah. And in fact, we've been in the book of Acts for a couple months now, and in the book of Acts, the first couple chapters, it's all Jewish followers of Jesus talking to Jewish people. And what do they time and time again convince them of and, and show them? That Jesus is the Messiah. They point to this brilliant thing the Lord has done, this thing that can't be fabricated or replicated, this incredible, miraculous unfolding of history, and people changed people repented and turned from what they were doing and brought themselves under the lordship of Jesus the Messiah. And then the word went out even further from there. And this is, this is brilliant. As you read the book of Acts and you continue to read right after the Gospels, the word goes out to every corner of the world. But the world at the time was ruled by an empire called Rome. And in Rome, they said things like this. They said, oh, um, see, uh, Caesar, who's head of Rome, he's king of the world. He's lord of all. In fact, they would also say that <laughs> there were some cults that, and they were pretty widespread, some cults actually would worship and deify Caesar and say he was a son of a god. They would say, mm, yes, Caesar is Lord, and that mm, there's no other name under heaven whereby you can be saved except the name of Caesar. And they would say that the, that, that the rule and reign, the coming rule and reign of Caesar was good news for the whole world and bring about a universal reign of peace. And they would say to put your faith and allegiance and trust in Caesar. And the early followers of Jesus were like, let's not. Let's respect the king, but Caesar's not Lord because <laughs> Jesus is Lord. And uh, Caesar is not a son of God. He's a dude and he died and stayed dead. No, let's, let me tell you about the true son of God. 
Yeah, no, 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 no. There's no other name under heaven given to man whereby they can be saved except the name of uh, Jesus and that the rule and reign of Jesus is actually good news for people and that we should put our faith and hope and allegiance and confidence in Jesus and people were changed and people came under the lordship of Jesus and the way of Jesus and his church and his right rule and reign has persisted from that point on. Read any history textbook, start with Rome. What kingdom has lasted? None. But the way of Jesus, his rule and his reign. And that's why we're here today. And so I wanna end today I want to wrap this up by, now that we've looked at this theme of Messiah, let's see where we as a church, as followers of Jesus, kind of fit into that. For years, centuries, this time of year, the church has celebrated Advent. And in Advent, we celebrate, just like in Handel's Messiah, we celebrate the arrival of Jesus the Messiah. And as we do this, We have to marvel at what the Lord has done. There's all these odds that that mathematicians have put together, of the odds of Jesus fulfilling all the Old Testament prophecies and doing all the things and fulfilling all the types. It's like impossible. It is a miracle what has happened. And we can see in this, just like Charles Jennings did when he sat down to write the lyrics to Messiah, that the Lord is active and involved in history. And the Bible's not a cute story. No, it's the unfolding of redemptive history. And it should fill us, like we talked about earlier, with awe and wonder. And sometimes in preaching and teaching, you wanna give practical steps to things. You wanna be really practical and like, let me help you with this. But sometimes you just have to proclaim pronounced truth. And this is one of those times where we just need to look at what the Lord has done and marvel and be filled with awe and wonder. And that's what we do at Advent. But then the church also for years has realized that we live in what we call, and maybe you're familiar with this, maybe not, we live in what's called the inter-Advent period. We live in the now and not yet. Jesus has come, but we, we await his return. And so in that time, we respond to the Advent. We respond to Jesus. We put our faith and our allegiance in Jesus over any riches or any wealth or any success or any desire or any other thing we give allegiance to. We place it in Jesus more and more, continual commitment each day. We respond out of that sense of awe and wonder. But then, as a church, as followers of Jesus, we continue to live the way Jesus called and led us into. We live it under his rule and his reign, and we endeavor to bring his rule and reign upon the earth, to be co-rulers as we were intended to in Genesis, to be co-rulers under our king, under the lordship of Jesus. And so we do, as Jesus said, we, 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 we buy into, we live into the teaching of loving God and neighbor. We move towards one another in compassion and Perhaps most profoundly, we tell others and point others to Jesus, the Messiah. And that can't be lost on us. And, and, and here's something that I've been challenged with. I read a book recently by a brilliant scholar who said, when you're sharing the gospel, tell the big story. Because sometimes that fills people with a sense of awe and wonder that we talked about that other ways just don't. And so share the gospel. Tell the story of what the Lord has done. And as we do that, and as we live in this inter-advent period, may we align our lives and submit our lives to the Lordship of Jesus as we do this. Just like we talked about at the beginning. And when I say that, I mean every aspect of life. Every decision we make every desire we have, everything we say, every relationship, everything on our screens, everything we do, our work, our play, our family, everything submitted and under the lordship of Jesus. And that is what we do in the inter-advent period. But then the church has always looked ahead to what we call or refer to as the second advent. And for years, the church has looked forward, just looked back this time of year at the first arrival, the first advent of Jesus, but looked forward to the second arrival of Jesus, the return of Jesus. 
And so I want to show you where things end in Scripture. As we looked at the big arc of Scripture, let me show you where things end. Let me show you where everything's going. And um, I was telling first service, people love the book of Revelation, and this isn't bad, but usually people are like, ooh, end time prophecy. And I'm like, well, make sure you read the end of it, though, okay? Like, don't miss the punchline of Revelation, because I found a lot of people don't know how Revelation ends. People don't know how the Bible ends, and it's brilliant and beautiful, and the church has held on to it for years. And this is what we read about in Revelation 5. Here's what's described. A throne room. And there's someone sitting on the throne. There's a king on a throne. And the king is surrounded by elders and multitudes of people from every tribe, tongue, and nation. And look what it says in in Revelation 5. Look at the consistency and the brilliance of God's word. Look at this. And one of the elders said to me, weep no more. Behold the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of who? David, do you see from Genesis to Revelation, do you see what the Lord has done? He has conquered so that he can open the scroll and its seven seals and enact what is going to happen next, enact the redemption of all things. And then here's, here's what's described next. I love this. It says, the writer of Revelation says, then I saw a new heaven and a new earth. Everyone say, new heaven, new earth. Where do we hear about heavens and earth the first time? Genesis, that's correct. And so look at this full arc narrative that's coming around. I saw a new heaven and a new earth for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away and the sea was no more. Heaven comes down. It goes on in the next verse to say that the new Jerusalem comes down and this is where the Lord, this is where Jesus, this is where the root of David, this is where the Messiah will dwell. And it will even say that there will be no need for a temple for the glory and the presence of the Lord will dwell among people. And then look at this. This is the last chapter of Revelation. And it says, and night will be no more. It says, and night will be no more. They will need no light of lamp or sun, for the Lord will be their light. And they will reign forever. In the new heavens and the new earth, when Jesus returns in second advent, <laughs> there's going to be a throne room with Jesus on the throne. And, we, and there's going to be a restoration and a redemption of all things. And we will finally come to that place of being good co rulers under the rulership and the kingship of Jesus, the risen Lord, the Messiah. And so from Genesis, from good creation to us being co-rulers through all of the travails of scripture and the unfolding of history where things go is the restoration of all things and jesus at the end of everything is on the throne and we are blessed to be able to co-rule in the new heavens and the new earth under his lordship and you know what for centuries talking about this has lifted the heavy heads and the heavy hearts of the church. It has imbued the church with confidence to overcome disease and illness and uncertainty and plagues and wars and rumors of war because the church has always known where things are going and who's really on the throne. And the church has always bowed in worship at this. The church has always lifted their hands in worship to this, to see this this wonder the Lord has done in the restoration of all things. And so we too as a church, living in a difficult time, we realize that there's a trajectory to things and that this is all going somewhere. And it is a trajectory of hope. There is hope because there's a king and a kingdom and there's a Messiah on the throne. Say, there is hope. And so maybe this finds you in a place where you're like, man, it's, it's, it has been rough. This, this has, it's, it's been brutal. Maybe this year you lost somebody. I did. Maybe you're battling illness in, in an intense way. I feel you. Maybe you lost a job. One of the comforts, again, of the church is that we have confidence in the ultimate rule and reign of Jesus the Messiah and we lose ourselves in worship and adoration and we do this there is fullness of joy and there's profundity in this and this is what we are created and called to do there is a trajectory of hope and so I want to respond today I want us to respond together today by singing so I'm going to invite you to stand and we're going to sing a refrain 
from Handel's Messiah. I mean, I wanted to do the whole thing, but it's three hours long, so we ain't got time for that. And then I wanted to get a whole orchestra in here, but they wouldn't fit because it wasn't socially distanced. So um, <laughs> we're going to sing this kind of remixed version that Hillsong Worship did. And we're going to sing this He Shall Reign refrain. Let me tell you something else about George Frazier Candle. Critics, when they saw Messiah, when they listened to Messiah, Again, they said they felt like they were lifted up and it was like to this, this heavenly plane. There's this glorious resplendence. And critics noticed that rather than, like most people did in Handel's day, rather than using all these expensive and famous soloists for the most important parts, actually Handel employed the chorus, the choir. And that's why the Hallelujah Chorus is so powerful because Handel believed that when people are singing about the Lordship, the Messiahship of Jesus in one voice and a loud and mighty and victorious and glorious voice, that something incredible happens. And in fact, <laughs> when my man Handel watched his own play, he said, I did think I did see the heavens open and I saw the great God himself because something powerful happens when we sing about the Lordship and Messiahship of Jesus together. There's juice to it. There's power. And that's how we're going to end today. And so as we transition to sing, allow me to speak a blessing and a benediction over you. May you be encouraged today. May you be filled with hope today. As we live between Advents, May you take courage and confidence in the Messiahship and Lordship of Jesus over and above all else. May we together be filled with awe and wonder at what the Lord has done. May we together submit and align our lives with Jesus. And may we celebrate the ultimate victory of Jesus over depression, over despair, over disease, and over death itself as we wait. And may we join our voices in rapturous, glorious course to Jesus, the Messiah. Grace and peace.
Come on and lift your voice to the man. take a moment to allow for some response and I know this time of year a lot of people will come back to church because maybe they're like oh kind of nostalgia or like yeah I like Christmas music or uh and maybe you heard some today feel like something started stirring maybe you feel like you got changed maybe if nothing else you felt intrigued. Maybe you, you felt kind of bemused by what, by what you heard. Wait, what? Maybe you had never heard this good news before. Maybe you had never heard it in this way. Or maybe you weren't in a place in the past to hear it. And maybe you sensed the Lord calling. You sensed something here today. And what we want to do is we want to give you an opportunity for you to step into the fullness of joy into following Jesus, to bring yourself under the Lordship and the Messiahship and the leadership of Jesus, to accept what he's done from Isaiah 53, accept him who is no sin, becoming sin, so we might have the righteousness of the Messiah. And so I want to give two different ways to respond. If you're watching on NMC Plus and, and you found us today, or just a friend sent you a link, and you're like, yeah, I'm gonna check that out. I want to give you an opportunity to respond. And then on the screen you're watching, there's going to be a prompt below. And if you want to take your first step in following Jesus, if you want to even just ask questions about what does that look like, click that response. Someone's going to get in there. Click the prompt. Someone's going to get in contact with you, and we will follow up with you personally. And if you're here in the room and you feel that same sense, that same calling, that same tug, or you're like, man, I'm hearing something different, seeing something different, I don't know. I just... I'm feeling a hope I've never felt before. I, I'm seeing things clear. I feel like clearly... I want to give you a chance to respond and take that first step. And so if you just want to text follow to the number on the screen, I'm big on this. I will follow up with you personally this week and we can talk through what that looks like. Maybe you're here today and your response is, bro, I need to go sign up for baptism. Go on a website, sign up for baptism. Maybe you need to take that next step and bring yourself under the rulership, the kingship, the messiahship of Jesus and experience that fullness of joy in that new life like we celebrated earlier. Maybe today's the day. But for the rest of us in the room, if you are a follower of Jesus, as we go into this next verse, Matt and I talked about this this week. This is a rich and beautiful verse. And here's what I want you to think about. I want to create intentionality around this moment. This next verse talks about when we stand before the Lord someday. I want you to think about how truly beautiful that is. See, I've been guilty in the past, and the Lord convicted me of this. I've always been about the present indwelling of the kingdom of God, the right rule and reign of God here and now, which is great. But I kind of was dismissive, dismissive about then and, and there and in and heaven and earth because I thought, well, that's like escapist. Like, I'm, I'm about here now. Here's where the Lord's convicted me. Man, it's about both. It's about living under the right rule and reign of Jesus now and in the new heavens and the new earth. And that day we stand before him, look around the room right now. Okay, now multiply that by like a billion. There's going to be billions of people surrounded 
the throne singing to Jesus. And so as we sing to our Messiah, here's my invitation to you. Picture that day as we are gathered with the saints who have come before us and those who have come after us, with those we've lost and, and those who are yet to be born. And I'm gonna invite you, raise your hand, sing in adoration to the Messiah. Maybe it looks like kneeling for you. I, sometimes when I sing about the kingship of Jesus, I have, to, I have to kneel. And so however you need to respond in this time, let us lift it up in this time. I stand. 